Gary King. I'm a microbial biologist at Louisiana State University. We're going to be talking today about humans, microbes, and global change. There are two overarching themes for this brief discussion of a rather substantial topic. Uh, the first theme, of course, is that we humans are transforming the Earth. And climate change is just one of many manifestations of those transformations. Uh, the extent to which we are transforming the planet gives rise to a fundamental challenge for both science and society that I've expressed here in the form of a simple question. Can we beneficially manage Earth's transformation in the future? In order to answer this question, we come to our second overarching theme, which is that as microbial biologists, we know that successful management is simply not going to be possible without understanding and even manipulating microbes from genes to the biosphere. So today, what we're going to cover are three uh, basic points. Uh, I'm going to provide some general examples of human-induced global change, just to provide uh, context. I'll cover some specific examples of microbe-human interactions that affect global change and their consequences, with a specific emphasis on atmospheric trace gases. So we'll look at methane, which is a radiatively active greenhouse gas that's about 20 times more potent than CO2 in terms of its greenhouse warming potential, and it's responsible for about 15% of current radiative forcing. We'll also look at um, nitrous oxide, N2O, which is radiatively active as well and has a GWP about 300 times that of CO2 and is responsible for about 7% of current radiative forcing. Then um, lastly, we'll take a look at uh, carbon monoxide, which is chemically very reactive in the troposphere. It determines to a large extent the oxidative state of the troposphere and as a result has an indirect radiative forcing that's roughly equivalent uh, to that of nitrous oxide. We will conclude then with uh, an enumeration of some of uh, the many challenges that lie ahead for us in the future. As we uh, proceed through this discussion, there's a fundamental principle that I would like to apply. Uh, it is a restating of Le Chatelier's principle, which most of you will likely recall, was first articulated in the context of chemical reaction equilibria and changes in reaction equilibria, equilibria in response to changes in reaction conditions. My restatement uh, is to provide a bit of context for human microbe interactions and global biogeochemistry. And there are uh, three points. The first is that a steady state system, uh, which largely characterizes much of the biosphere, uh, when is uh, perturbed by changes in reactant concentrations, temperature, water, or other variables will respond to those changes until a new steady state is established. A second point is that responses will be transmitted throughout a system depending on the connectivities or networks that exist among its members. And the third point is that the responses of any given system may be chaotic and as a result unexpected. To express this more simply, human actions in Earth's systems evoke wide-ranging responses, some of which are unpredictable and adverse to human well-being. Let's now look at some of these general examples of our transformation of Earth. And uh, for the first of these, we'll take a look at mining and mineral production, and we'll simply look at the bottom line here, total global mineral production which on an annual basis is estimated at uh, something more than 84 billion metric tons. We'll add to that total global coal production, which annually is estimated at something on the order of 6.4 billion metric tons. 
giving us collectively uh, something greater than 90 gigatons per year of raw mineral and coal production. This value compares with total terrestrial net primary production of 140 gigatons dry weight per year. So in other words, what we humans are doing in terms of raw mineral and coal production is roughly equivalent to the total mass of plant production on uh, the terrestrial part of the planet. There are of course numerous consequences that follow from this, again invoking Le Chatelier. Uh, one of the consequences that we'll note involves the sulfide oxidizing proteobacteria that oxidize sulfide containing ores, uh, which include metal ores and coal that are exposed by mining, resulting in acid mine drainage or AMD. This uh, phenomenon is basically uh, the result of pyrite oxidation in the presence of molecular oxygen producing iron oxyhydroxide, basically rust, which you see uh, essentially coating uh, the surface of, of the stream in the background and foreground. And then in addition, there is a production of copious amounts of sulfuric acid. This is a global problem. In the eastern United States alone, uh, more than 13,000 kilometers of streams have been degraded by acid mine drainage. And this value is much larger, um, obviously, on a global scale. The second example of a global transformation of the planet involves our massive consumption of bioresources. This has been referred to as human appropriation of net primary production. What this table shows are estimates of HANPP uh, published in 2004. And what these estimates are based on is the amount of terrestrial net primary production consumed directly as food and indirectly in uh, the form of meat, milk, and eggs produced from primary production. In addition, uh, the amount of primary production that is used for uh, paper, fibers, both plant fibers and animal fibers, wood for fuel construction, and so on, are added up as well. The bottom line shown here in this black box gives us the percentage of net primary production that is appropriated for exclusive human use. In other words, uh, it is removed from the rest of the biosphere. The intermediate estimate uh, for 2000, uh, as published in 2004, uh, was that humans are using about 20% of total terrestrial net primary production. This value has obviously grown since that time and is expected to grow further with increases in human population uh, projected to reach 9 billion um, uh, by the year uh, 2050. Um, the question, of course, that arises is uh, what level of net primary production can we sustainably uh, remove from the biosphere? Is it 20 percent, uh, 30 percent, or more? It's also important to realize that what we're doing in terrestrial systems is also occurring in the oceans. This is a plot that shows um, perturbations of marine ecosystems presented as the percentage of local net primary production that's required to support fisheries. What you see is uh, throughout the Indo-Pacific, the Northern Pacific, uh, the Northeastern Atlantic, uh, the Northeastern Pacific off the coast of Alaska, as well as um, the Eastern Pacific uh, fisheries off South America, that the levels of primary production that we are appropriating through fish consumption are on the order of 30% or more, and in essence equivalent to or even greater than uh, the values for terrestrial systems.
Again, the question arises, what levels of appropriation are sustainable? There are uh, numerous consequences in the context of Le Chatelier for marine biogeochemistry and ecosystem structure that result from human perturbations in these systems. I'm just going to give you uh, one example. Um, uh, the point here is that we exploit marine uh, systems at present that consist of a complex assemblage of organisms in a multi-trophic uh, structure and those systems are reasonably stable to certain levels of perturbations however once perturbations exceed uh, a given threshold which uh, in fact is hard to predict the system can shift to an alternate stable state in this case one dominated by uh, gelatinous zooplankton which are not exploitable for human use. There is already evidence that this is occurring in some fisheries and some coastal areas and of course it's of increasing concern uh, since the extent to which this transformation takes place uh, limits our ability to look to the oceans for um, food. Here is our third example of global scale human induced changes. Um, in this case uh, the point is that we have come to understand that in the last 150 years or so human activities have increased global heat storage uh, with the consequence for um, changes in our climate. What this plot shows is a record of inferred and observed temperatures over the last five million years and if you notice on the x-axis, the uh, time span is variable. Um, so if we look into uh, the Pliocene and early Pleistocene, what we see relative to temperatures um, for the Holocene mean, which is given in this black dotted line, are temperatures in the early part of the period, which are a little bit warmer than present, and then decline variably um, for a longer term uh, cooling that over the last uh, 500,000 years or so um, gave rise to a series of glacial and interglacial periods. Um, so you see this rise and fall in temperature. And in the last 10,000 years, we've seen uh, a warming trend, albeit one that's been marked by uh, some relatively cool periods, for example, the Little Ice Age. And then moving forward into the um, industrial period, um, what we've begun to see is a steady increase in uh, temperature uh, to a point that uh, the current global mean now exceeds or is equal to uh, temperatures, um, the maximum temperatures that have been observed over this past five million year period and the projected uh, temperatures over the next uh, 50 to uh, uh, 80 to 90 years or so would give us values well above anything um, observed or inferred for the last five million years. Uh, changes in temperature of course um, with respect to uh, magnitude are important but what's equally important is the rate of change which is plotted here so we see um, magnitude the total amount of change for a number of different climatic events throughout Earth's history as well as changes that are taking place in a contemporary context plus projected changes based on different scenarios for fossil fuel use what the green block, uh, box here shows are um, the pre-human changes in temperature. And what you can see is that all of these occur at a rate that's less than or substantially less than half a degree per century. In contrast, the post-industrial changes and the projected changes for the future are all occurring at a much higher rate.
And so it's this increase in rate that is of great concern for the ability of the biosphere to adapt to uh, human transformations of the planet. Now, all of these kinds of transformations, human appropriation of net primary production, um, mineral and uh, coal mining, uh, our energy use, um, changes in climate have affected global biogeochemical cycles. What this table shows us is for several different elements, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, um, water is oxygen and hydrogen, and then for um, sediments as, as sort of a bulk assemblage, how human activity has affected um, natural cycles. What we see for carbon is that we've had actually a relatively small effect, um, roughly on the order of 13 percent in terms of the total amount of carbon uh, that moves through the carbon cycle. However, for nitrogen, human activities have basically um, doubled nitrogen flow through the nitrogen cycle. Um, we've had about a 400 percent increase in terms of uh, phosphorus in the phosphorus cycle. Our effect on the sulfur cycle is equivalent to the nitrogen cycle. We've roughly doubled the flow of sulfur through the sulfur cycle. And then, of course, we've had a substantial effect on the movement of sediment through um, the biogeochemical system, largely as a consequence of, of construction activities and agricultural activity in uh, terrestrial systems. Let's now look at a few of the ways in which human disturbances have become manifest in these different cycles. This is um, a representation of the carbon cycle. I'm not going to go through all the details of these reservoirs and their transformations. Basically what I want to focus on is the fact that humans have enhanced uh, flow of carbon through this yellow box, which represents a set of anaerobic transformations of organic matter. And essentially what we've done is increase the flow of carbon through uh, ruminant digestive systems, through uh, agricultural wetlands, um, for example, uh, rice wetland systems, and waste treatment systems. And the result of these anaerobic fermentations and transformations is an increase in the rate of methanogenesis or methane um, production. At the same time, we have uh, a number of activities that have decreased the rate at which methane can be removed from the atmosphere, so we've inhibited uh, methanogenesis, and obviously the consequence of that is that we've increased the flux of methane to the atmosphere. At the same time, we have also obviously stimulated uh, the flow of of carbon from fossil reservoirs um, into the atmosphere as CO2. We see the impacts of these changes when we look at the atmospheric methane budget. Here's the atmospheric methane budget uh, for the decade from 2000 to 2009. Rates of methane production are uh, presented here in teragrams per year. There are two types of sources. Um, broad sources that are identified, natural sources, rates of which are about 350 teragrams per year. Those are dominated by uh, methane production and fluxes from natural wetlands, which count for about two-thirds of the total. Second broad category um, includes a variety of anthropogenic sources, sources that we control, and note that uh, they are roughly equivalent to the natural sources, so in effect we've doubled the methane cycle. Anthropogenic sources are largely dominated by methane production and fluxes from agricultural systems, particularly wet and rice, and also um, waste treatment systems. In addition, there's a significant amount of methane that arises from uh, fossil fuel use, particularly uh, natural gas and, and hydrocarbon use. One point to note is that methanogenic bacteria and also um, their action in concert with methanotrophic or methane oxidizing bacteria dominate the natural sources. 
In contrast, human sources are a mix of both biogenic or microbial sources and abiogenic sources. The latter um, essentially represent the fossil fuels. Let's now take a look at um, human impacts on the global nitrogen cycle. In effect, what we have uh, done through the use of fossil fuels as an energy subsidy is increase the uh, flow of nitrogen from the atmosphere into uh, fixed nitrogen pools, especially ammonia, largely driven by the Haber-Bosch process. But in addition, we also introduce nitrogen through um, the cultivation of legumes and through combustion of fossil fuels, which produces um, N2O and, or other forms of, of nitrogen oxides uh, that uh, interterrestrial and aquatic systems through precipitation. The sum of all of these human controlled sources of nitrogen fixation is about 15 teramoles per year. The sum of natural nitrogen fixation in terrestrial systems and marine systems is about 18 teramoles per year. So you see that we've contributed substantially to an acceleration of the nitrogen cycle. And one of the consequences of this extensive level of human nitrogen fixation is a substantial land to sea transfer of nitrogen in several different forms. And again, invoking the Chatelier's principle, uh, one of the consequences of that nitrogen transfer is a global scale eutrophication and hypoxia in coastal zones. What this map shows are uh, coastal regions um, along uh, the Atlantic coast of the U.S., the Gulf coast of the U.S., um, across northern Europe, as well as in Asia, that are either hypoxic or that are substantially eutrophied and subject to hypoxia. You can see this is clearly a global scale problem, a consequence of human disturbances of the nitrogen cycle. However, uh, human impacts occur throughout the microbial nitrogen cycle. They're not just limited to the route involving the fixation of N2 to ammonia, but they include um, transformations of ammonia to nitrite and nitrate, uh, collectively nitrification, as well as processes such as denitrification, reduction of nitrate to N2, and anamox here, the uh, coupling of ammonia and nitrate to produce into. One of the important points is that uh, two of these processes, nitrification and denitrification, um, produce trace gases, nitrous oxide and nitric oxide, that are introduced to the atmosphere where they play, play important roles in uh, tropospheric chemistry and in um, radiative forcing. This table uh, provides an indication of the significance of human disturbances for uh, nitrous oxide. What it shows is a compilation of estimates of natural and human controlled um, nitrous oxide production from the year 1500 to 2006. And what you can see in the year 1500 is that the human term largely associated with agriculture was relatively small compared to natural sources of nitrous oxide production such that we accounted for only about 4.3 percent of the total. However, as you move forward in time what you see is the contribution from agriculture and from energy and biomass burning increasing substantially such that by 2006 our contribution is up to 44 percent of the total and of course the total has increased substantially uh, over time as well. Not surprisingly uh, the impacts of human activity on methane production and nitrous oxide production uh, have become manifest through changes in the concentrations of these gases in the atmosphere uh, 
Uh, they were relatively stable for something like uh, 1,700 years. Um, and in the last 300 years, they have begun to rise exponentially. We see the trend for methane here in the blue, the trend for nitrous oxide here in the black. And of course, this correlates uh, very closely with CO2, largely because um, our ability to affect uh, methane as well as nitrous oxide is dependent on our access to uh, fossil fuel energy to subsidize our activities in agriculture and in industry. Now what I'd like to do is provide uh, a few specific examples of how human uh, activities interact with microbes in ways that specifically affect these um, different trace gases, so methane, nitrous oxide NO, and carbon monoxide. And I'm going to begin with um, an example of land use impacts on atmospheric methane. So as uh, we humans change the uses of the terrestrial surface, we change microbial activities within the soils um, of those systems. Here we have uh, sites uh, in two different states within the U.S., Maine and Georgia, and a comparison of methane removal from the atmosphere by soils in both cultivated and non-cultivated uh, control sites. Uh, methane uptake um, in soils uh, is the province of um, a group of proteobacteria for the most part. Uh, methanotrophs that make a living off of using um, atmospheric methane. And what you can see is that uh, relative to um, a non-cultivated control system, cultivated soils have a substantial reduction in their capacity to uh, consume atmospheric methane. This is true for sites in Maine as well as for Georgia. And so the consequence is that land use change severely decreases methane uptake, which means that there's a diminished capacity of soils to remove methane from the atmosphere, um, the methane that we're adding uh, through ruminant uh, uh, sources and um, cultivated wetlands. The effect of land use change on methane um, brings us actually to the nitrogen cycle or connections with the nitrogen cycle uh, because uh, the impacts are largely mediated by fertilization. This is a table um, that provides one of uh, many examples that we know about. It shows a comparison of methane uptake in a native unfertilized pasture and then uh, gives us uh, rates associated with different types of uh, crop cultivation, corn or maize versus wheat, and different types of uh, water regimes, irrigation or not. In all cases, what we see are substantial reductions in the capacity of, of these managed systems to remove methane from the atmosphere relative to control systems. And it's um, increased nitrogen that is a major culprit in that response. Nitrogen is not the only variable, however. We know that um, at a global scale, anthropogenic activity has been acidifying soils, often with adverse outcomes. When we look at the response of methane uptake by soils to pH, what we see is that, as in this case, the pH optimum often tends to correspond with in situ uh, pH regimes. So, the natural populations of methanotrophs are adapted to in situ pH regimes. And as these soils become acidified, what then tends to happen is activity falls off, so the capacity is diminished. Uh, it is evident, however, that the uh, effect of pH is somewhat dependent on the source of the acid. Um, this is an example with uh, pH values over in this case, a relatively limited window, um, basically something like uh, 4.4 to 4, 
Uh, so what we see for sulfuric acid is a relatively small effect compared to nitric acid for which we see a very strong uh, inhibitory effect. Again, this brings us to a connection with the nitrogen cycle and in particular the production of NOx and nitric acids associated with fossil fuel uh, combustion. Now while nitrogen fertilization has an adverse impact on methane uptake, the consequence of which is an increased lifetime of methane in the atmosphere and therefore an increase in the rate of forcing of methane in the atmosphere. There's a positive effect of nitrogen fertilization on nitrous oxide emissions. Uh, the net effect of uh, climate change, of course, is the same. Um, increased N2O uh, means um, an increase in radiative forcing. What this table shows is that um, the effect of agriculture uh, on nitrous oxide is global. It occurs uh, everywhere and it's dependent on the source of nitrogen used for fertilization. Nitrogen fixation associated with legumes uh, provides the smallest impact relative to animal waste as a source of nitrogen or mineral nitrogen um, added for fertilizer. What we also see in this table is that um, largely as a function of mineral nitrogen and animal waste use, um, nitrous oxide production in Asia accounts for something on the order of 40% to 50% of total global nitrous oxide uh, production. Uh, this is a value that uh, may well increase in the future uh, to the extent that wetland, wetland rice production increases and uh, to the extent that um, mineral nitrogen and animal waste nitrogen are required as fertilizers to support that. Nitrogen fertilization also increases nitric oxide, nitric oxide emissions. We haven't talked much about NO. NO is a very important trace gas that occurs in the troposphere. It's important for numerous reasons, one of which is that uh, it is a reactant in a uh, set of reactions that uh, ultimately lead to the production of tropospheric ozone. So again, a connection between the nitrogen cycle and other gases illustrating uh, uh, one of the uh, aspects of Le Chatelier's principle. What we see in this plot is that as nitrogen application uh, to soils increases, there is a corresponding increase in emission of nitric oxide. Um, this too is uh, another illustration of Le Chatelier's principle at work. Now turning to carbon monoxide, um, we again see effects of land use. However, in this case, uh, uh, the consequences are, are somewhat different than they are for methane and nitric or nitric oxide and nitrous oxide. Um, what these two plots show are time courses over an annual cycle of either the emission of carbon monoxide from soils or the removal of carbon monoxide from the atmosphere. Values less than zero represent a net emission from the system to the atmosphere, while values above zero represent net consumption by soils of CO from the atmosphere. And what this, what this plot shows is that the annual cycle for forest um, results in an overall net uptake that's less than that which we observe in cultivated systems. In other words, uh, forest conversion in this case increases atmospheric CO removal, which is actually uh, something of a uh, benefit uh, in the sense that removal of um, carbon monoxide um, helps decrease the lifetime of atmospheric methane and so helps um, ameliorate to a small degree um, some of the consequences of human activity for uh, climate change and heat storage. The effects of, of uh, 
um, crop type and soil management on uh, uh, CO uptake um, are illustrated here. And what this figure shows us is that regardless of crop type, whether um, we're talking about uh, corn or uh, soybeans or different types of, of soil management till versus um, no-till, for example, uh, we see basically the same stimulation of CO uptake versus an unmanaged um, woodland uh, control system. So I'd like to um, switch from these trace gases that affect climate um, now to just uh, make the point that human interactions also affect cycles of many other elements, uh, including some of the toxic elements such as the metalloids. Um, example of metalloid is mercury, as well as uh, arsenic and selenium. And I'm just going to provide one example. In this case, I'm illustrating uh, the transformations of mercury. And these are well known. There are several areas here that I have indicated in these uh, pink boxes where bacteria play important roles. Uh, the most notorious and perhaps well-known role for bacteria involves the uh, methylation of mercury by sulfate reducing bacteria to produce perhaps the most toxic form of mercury, methylmercury, uh, which can be bioaccumulated and of course uh, which results in a variety of adverse consequences for human fish consumption. However, when we look at um, human impacts on the mercury cycle, we find an illustration of this point from uh, Le Chatelier's principle that we can't always predict uh, system responses and that uh, we can expect some surprises. What this plot uh, shows is that the proportion of streptomycin resistance in bacterial isolates from stream sediments along a transect with increasing uh, um, uh, mercury concentration rises as mercury concentration rises. And so it turns out that human disturbances of mercury distribution can contribute to the maintenance of antibiotic resistance even when antibiotics are not introduced directly from human activity. So this now brings me uh, to uh, the final um, set of points that I would like to discuss. Um, I'd like to enumerate some of the challenges for the future, uh, how we can get along with microbes to solve some of the problems that are facing us. The first of many different points we could discuss uh, is that one of our challenges is in maintaining and increasing prop, crop production while decreasing nitrogen use. The goals associated with this challenge are to reduce N2O emissions by reducing nitrification and denitrification as well. Uh, we also want to decrease the extent of nitrogen eutrophication of freshwater systems and coastal marine systems and increase uh, the consumption of methane from the atmosphere by soils through stimulation of methanotrophic activity. A second major challenge is to manage ruminant methane production, perhaps by adjusting the forage that we provide ruminants, as well as perhaps by using vaccines to affect uh, methanogenic activity directly. And again, the goal in this case is to decrease methane emissions from ruminants by altering methanogen activity. A fourth uh, major challenge is increasing reliance on symbiotic and associative nitrogen fixing plants. Uh, a considerable part of uh, the plant protein used by human populations uh, is already derived from legumes, um, but our most nitrogen-intensive plants uh, 
uh, include uh, things like maize or corn and wheat. And so we need to find uh, mechanisms that allow us to um, decrease the requirements for nitrogen associated with producing uh, those crops. Um, so we want to decrease fertilizer use as a goal and as a consequence reduce nitrous oxide emissions and eutrophication. Some possibilities um, that uh, uh, are already um, employed in, include enhancing associative nitrogen fixation for sugarcane production and in the future uh, we may be able to use a variety of molecular approaches to manipulate corn and wheat systems to support either associative or symbiotic nitrogen fixation. Uh, a final point I'm going to mention for today uh, as a challenge is that of increasing soil carbon storage um, or increasing carbon sequestration. We have substantially reduced the amount of carbon uh, present in agricultural soils and so the goal is to manipulate plant mycorrhiza and bacterial interactions in order to reintroduce and stabilize soil organic matter with the result that we would be able to offset some of the CO2 that we're currently producing and that we're no doubt going to continue producing in the future. I'd like to conclude by noting that the future is in our hands and is also in the collective hands of our microbial partners and working with them, we can create a sustainable path forward. Thank you very much.